You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, authors, and museum directors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we are again with Mr. Jay Bobo, the state president of the South Carolina Society Children of the American Revolution. So welcome, Jay. Great to be here again. Jay, we, we've been looking forward to your, your episodes, and uh, before we get started, we want to give a shout out or recognize one of our affiliates, the Cultural and Heritage Museums of York County, South Carolina, including the Southern Revolutionary War Institute, focusing on the Revolutionary War in the South Carolina backcountry. So, Jay, tell us a little bit about uh, what we're talking about today. This is, uh, this is a battle that I'm not too familiar with, but uh, it had some, some interesting tie-ins to the revolution there towards the end. Yeah, so the battle um, I'm discussing is Fort Galfin, um, and it really helps when you look at it. Um, it's on a property called Silver Bluff. It was owned by George Galfin. It's near Augusta, right on the Savannah River. Um, it's, at the moment, it's owned by the Silver Bluff Audubon Society. So if any of you listeners out there are, are around Augusta, um, South Carolina, and want to go by, it's not hard to find. It's free to get in, and you can see the site. The Savannah River, when you look at it on maps, it just kind of goes, you know, kind of at an angle up the side of Georgia and South Carolina. But really, it kind of winds and curves uh, as it as it meanders out of the mountains and down to the to the ocean. Tell us a little bit about the the background of Fort Galfin. So George Galfin came to South Carolina from Ireland in 1737, and he set up a trading post at Silver Bluff by the Savannah River, and it was along Native American trade routes which really helped the trading post itself. Native Americans were constantly passing through there. He had a great relationship with the um, Indians, including the Creeks, Chickasaw, and Choctaws, which was really helpful um, in the American Revolution. I'll get there in a second. He actually married a Creek Indian, which dramatically helped his relationship with the Creeks and the other tribes in the area. The Indian tribes gave him all sorts of pelts, skins, um, in exchange for the European goods that the Native Americans hadn't seen at the time. During the French and Indian War, Silver Bluff was fortified and served as a refuge for Anglo and Irish families from the Cherokees. The Creek Indians actually helped in join in defense of Silver Bluff with an expectation, expectation of provision. Once again, one of those relationships that was a mutual benefit to both parties. Once the American Revolution did break out, Silver Bluff became one of the largest information gathering networks in the South. Uh, it was a place of negotiation with the Creeks in order to prevent them from joining the British side of the war. And traders and other agents really became a web of informants and spies um, in the South, turning Silver Bluff into pretty much a way station um, with lots of information for the Continental Army. Uh, it was so important that troops were actually dispatched later to protect it from the British and Loyalists. And the British obviously knew how important uh, George Galfin was. Uh, the Continental Congress appointed uh, Galfin as the Continental Commission of the Southern Department of Indian Affairs, so a big title for the South. He was clearly the man for the job as the war went on. He kept two of the larger Southeastern tribes neutral during the American Revolution, which was huge because the British wanted to give, if the Americans had to fight the war on two fronts, and make all of a sudden the war that was already hard to fight just became a lot harder. So that was huge. It was a tenuous peace between the Indians and the and the settlers in the back country. In fact, I I had an episode about that uh, where a neutral stance was was like you said very important. Yeah, and back to what I was saying um, about how important the British obviously knew how important Galfin was. He had in a dis letter to Henry Lawrence in December of 1777. Uh, he referenced threats to his safety. Uh, there were there are at least two known assassination attempts that went on on his life. In one of these references, he mentions a group of men that were staying just outside Silver Bluff for three days. They were asking about his schedule, what his day to day looks like, and then they released horses and then just fled the scene uh, when they got caught wind that George Galfin might be getting word of what they were doing. By 1778, the British had a price on Galfin's head, 500 pounds, dead or alive. So that just shows exactly how valuable he really was to the British. Do we have any descriptors of what Galfin looked like? 
Yeah, so George Galflin was pretty, he wasn't super tall. Um, he was built a little bit bigger. Um, so that's really all we have in terms of what he might have looked like. There's a couple pictures, um, paintings of him online that probably describe him a little bit better. Um, he was born in 1709, so when the war broke out, that would have made him almost 70. He actually died before the battle took place. Silver Bluff was actually occupied twice um, during the American Revolution. The first time, he escaped. Um, he caught wind that the British were coming. He escaped, and then he came, and the British eventually left um, his plantation, took lots of supplies, and pretty much raided the place. Um, and then Galfin came back, and then uh, the British would return and, um, in May of 1780, and they'd occupy his home, um, take him prisoner, and neutralize his efforts in the American Revolution at that time because it was just occupied. And he awaited his house to be taken to Savannah to be put on trial. Um, and then when, once the British occupied the fort after capturing Galfin, they um, fortified it more and renamed it Fort Dreadnought. So that pretty much leads you up. And then Galfin died in December, the December before the battle took place, so December 1780. Um, well, tell me about the battle. So the battle occurred when Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lighthorse, also known as Lighthorse um, Henry Lee, was on his way to bring relief to Elijah Clark at Beach Island when his, he turned troops over um, to command uh, with Major Michael Rudolph in charge, and Lee took his cavalry to help cut off possible relief from Augusta. Um, that siege was going on at the time. The British occupied fort held about 184 British soldiers under command of Captain Samuel Roworth. Rudolph approached the fort on May 21st of 1781 and then dispatched a pretty ingenious plan. He sent the majority of his force out to hide around the fort in bushes and things of that nature. And then he sent a very small detachment just to draw, enough to draw the British outside of the fort. There were two entrances um, to the fort, one in the front, one in the back. So when the small detachment gathered all the troops outside the fort, the Patriot forces then rushed inside from the back and pretty much ambushed the um, lured. The, once the British were outside their fortifications, it was pretty much game over for the British forces, um, which was huge when you think about um, all these battles. Um, the only four British died, and the rest of the 180 were captured. It was crucial. The battle itself and the aftermath was crucial for the um, goods that were obviously at the fort at the time which always helps the more supplies the better, and then and help for Savannah River, which was a major trade route at the time. So at the time, there was a British garrison, and didn't they just get supplies for the Indians right before they, they laid siege to the, yeah. to the fort? Yeah, if that trade had gone through, there's no telling what would have happened. Um, I think it's surprising to me because we, we think about the snow campaign happening early in the war, but it's surprising to me here we are late in the war, and they're still supplying, they're trying to supply the Cherokee and, and other Indians against the settlers. Yeah, and it's back to what I was saying earlier in the episode. You know, you look, and fighting a war on two fronts is impossible between the British and the um, British on one side and the Indians on the other. You fi you start fighting that war um, on two fronts, and it's you got to split your troops, split your supplies that was already low on both of those we're both already small in numbers, so when you split them up, it definitely doesn't help. So who were these patriot leaders again? What was their background? I mean, it, it sounds like they had been war fighters before to come up with this ruse. Uh, yeah, so Major Michael Rudolph, the commander of the um, patriot forces, had been watching Light Horse Lieutenant Colonel uh, Henry Lee. Lee himself was a very well-known commander in the South um, at the time, so he was learning from him. And just kind of implemented tactics that they had seen before or had been or had talked about before. So it's it's amazing what um, you know different commanders in this uh, in the American Revolution came up with to win a battle. It's not the first time, and it wasn't the last time stuff like this was used. Um, creativity was huge. So, Jay, how many were on the American side? You talked about the British, but how many were on the American side? Uh, there's no no number. Um, no one really documented it. However, when you look at casualties, there were eight wounded um, in the small gunfight, and there was there was one death, although it had nothing to do with the battle itself. He died of heat stroke, unfortunately. Um, so not a lot of casualties on either side. 
in terms of deaths and wounded. So that ruse worked? The ruse did. It um, worked extremely well. Um, and it's really impressive that they came up with that. So what happened to the supplies? What were they? The supplies um, were, were they taken. Used for? They were used to help relieve the Patriot forces at the Siege of Augusta that was going on about that same time. So almost immediately they were put to use. Yeah, they were. They went from not being to being used to the British to immediately put into effect for the Patriot forces. Outstanding. So what happened after after this battle? What happened to the prisoners? What happened to the uh, the Patriots? What happened to the fort? Um, the fort itself. Um, there's not a lot of documentation that actually happened. Um, what happened after it? The Patriots held the fort for the remainder of the war. Um, it's it was then turned over. It was a discrepancy between um, Fort Galfin's children on who owned how much of the land, and it kind of just got split up um, into lots of different smaller and smaller pieces as the generations went on um, until the Audubon Society. Um, and the 1900s collected all of it and got the land back. What a fascinating story, Jay. Uh, tell us a little bit about how people can get a hold of uh, your group if they're interested in joining uh, and you know where they can find information on that. Yes, so the uh, National Society, Children of the American Revolution, does have a website, um, nscar.org. You can go to there, find information about how to join um, Kids from zero until your 22nd birthday can join. There's a society in the United States, uh, France, Great Britain, and Germany if you want to join there. All you have to do is have proof that you had an ancestor that um, fought in the war or or served aid to the Patriots in any way. Um, it doesn't even have to be huge. It's just any small token that you can prove helped the war effort and you're in. Are there other ways to join uh, the, 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 the parent organization yeah, of so SAR, DAR? Yes, um, you can. So once you turn 18, that four-year span from when you become a legal adult, um, and that four-year span from 18 to 22, um, you can actually apply and be a dual member of both DAR um, and CAR or CAR and SAR. It's a dual um, membership. So it's interesting. It is an application process, and you do have to genealogically trace your trace your ancestors back to the revolution. But they, it doesn't necessarily mean that that particular ancestor uh, is your same last name, or that particular ancestor uh, was actually uh, documented as a fighter. They could have. There could be war records where they uh, they provided corn or grain or something to patriots at that time yeah and anything like that um anything like that works i know when my mom was when she got involved in daughters of the american revolution and in us and children of the american revolution it really hit her off on her um genealogical um hobby and she's been really deep into it ever since and we have we found several um different names to go under lots of last names i think she actually worked her way up to 22 um, different people um, in the war um, that she's found and all different names all different lines when you go through you know the further you get back obviously there's more and more family names that came through or stopped and all that stuff so it's really it's really interesting to look at um, and it's a fun organization I've been in a part for six years and as far as it's always fun the history's good to learn about um, and it really provides a great look at the war itself, in all aspects. Jay, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thank you for having me. All right.